first question let's launch get straight into it sure, uh, sure. The, new, the new genesis uh, revisited seconds out cd blu-ray is out on the yes. 2nd of september Indeed. in your opinion how does this compare with the original mix of the genesis album well i think that i think it's better produced i have to say i mean if you compare the drum sound for instance and the sound of the bass in quite apart from anything else um i think there's a i think there's a perceptible difference i mean you know there's been so many years in between where yes. recording techniques have have improved and there are more variations that you can get into something but essentially you know it's it's a live band going for it today as opposed to a live band going for it what, 45 years ago yeah. you know that's that's the difference yeah um, I read somewhere that uh, I was reading about the Nursery Crime album, which is uh, probably my favourite Genesis album, that much of the musical box was actually written before you joined the band. Apparently. I'm just wondering how much did you actually contribute to the musical box and how much were you in, instrumental in shaping the return of the giant hogweed? Ah, OK. Well, in both cases, uh, I contributed the guitar parts, uh, which weren't written. And um, so, you know, there there is that. Um, of course, with nursery crime uh, and specifically musical box, uh, the interplay between not just the guitars, because there's more than one, uh, but the uh, the keyboard was all important um, to be able to do sounds that were complementary to each other and almost indistinguishable from each other. I mean, that beautiful um, um, little musical box motif on the guitar yes. really, really shapes the song, I think. Yeah, that, that wasn't there beforehand, and uh, I that, that's very speed. In those days, you slowed the tape down to half speed, so when you played it back, you were you know a whole octave higher, and it gained a certain um, it gained a certain something. As as it was with the um, uh, the introduction was was recorded at half speed as well, and that was uh, Mike Rutherford's twelve string on a, an open tuning. Again, you know, the, the idea of high sounds that were facilitated by very speed, same techniques that were being used by the Beatles to make things sound brighter and often younger. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's that's the how it was. Diamond is a fantastic example of that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, there's, there's ex extraordinary stuff going on and um, it's absolutely lovely. Yes, I think that, you know, they used it on vocals from time to time to give it a slightly unreal quality the cartoonish aspect from time to time and as genesis we employed that fairly liberally back in the day okay <clears throat> um you described seeing king crimson you said um uh the music was eclectic disciplined poetic yet yet anarchic i'm just wondering was the burgeoning progressive scene like a road to damascus moment for you and how influenced were you by the british blues movement well you're covering a very wide church with all of that. <laughs> and um, I, I think um, those of us who listened <clears throat> to certain things as a guilty pleasure um, and at the same time um, longed for the separate strands to come together. Um, I'm talking about, in my case, of listening to Baroque music as personified by Andres Segovia plays J.S. Bach. Um, listening to that on one hand and then all the great British blues guitarists and in a way Hendrix joined that brigade um, having to make it from here on our shores first of all to be truly noticed um, it was a wonderful time you had Eric Clapton, Peter Green, Jeff Beck and then you know latterly um, uh, Jimi Hendrix going back you know, a, a year later, Hendrix arrives on our shores in 67, difference between 66 and 67. Uh, and Mick Taylor, of course, and it seemed as if John Mayall had all the had all the greats waltzing in and out of the that band. Um, yeah, that guitar chair was very rarely empty from you know, with great players. But you're talking about these separate types of music coming together, the pan genre approach that is is um i was going to say prog's legacy but really it was you know the gauntlet was thrown down really uh, progressive stuff combines everything at at its best it it borrows from everything and um allows it to scene change from one genre 
to another, which is why I think it's so pictorial in a way. It conjures images and uh, it's full of romance, sometimes of place, sometimes of time, yeah. sometimes of person. But um, uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, we we're talking about King Crimson specifically, um, the power of epitaph, yeah. uh, a protest song in orchestral dress um, with operatic overtones. Um, uh, one is, is, that what drove, is that what drove you to want to add Mellotron to Genesis? This thing to Epitaph? Yes, I, th I, I think that, that I think that Epitaph is one of the great Mellotron moments. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the Mellotron crescendo is 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 without parallel. Um, I'm always well. I used to compliment my pal um, Ian McDonald, who's not long past, you know, on that, you know that thing that, that the rest of us perceived as a, a mushroom cloud um, as it as it uh, grew in, in in height and stature and just flooded everything went well into the red and um, distorted like hell and god knows how they managed to cut it on the original disc but they did and yeah. um, um, I know Robert Fripp describes it as a good fairy doesn't he a lot of the things that happened to um, yeah. uh, uh, but I think there's a lot of um, uh, blood, sweat, and toil that goes into uh, uh, something which is as stunning a debut as that. And I was lucky enough to see them live when they were perhaps deciding what to include on a future album. Yeah. Um, there were some unfinished songs, um, and not everything made it onto the final cut, but um, there was some wonderful stuff. Oh. As was the case with Genesis, sometimes things didn't make it out of the rehearsal room, but I thought, oh my God, you know. What a great moment we should you know we should use that and usually later on if i thought there was something worth preserving i would go back to it sometimes yeah. even 50 years later i i think now oh, there's a kernel of an idea a shape there something you know from a very competitive team very capable team but very competitive with each other at times and um uh i suspect that's the downfall of, of many a band the competitiveness um but as far as I'm concerned, certain bands were full of geniuses, and um, Beatles was one of them, Crimson another, and um, and Genesis another. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, your first concert with Genesis was at uh, London University. Um, I'm also interested in how uh, have you any memories of that gig, but also how um, how beneficial was that Six Bob tour? And did you learn anything watching Linda's Farm of Underground mm -hmm. Generation from the sides? Um, yes, um, that first gig um, uh, was a disaster for me. Um, the equipment, the new equipment, which I was given on the night, um, malfunctioned and um, <clears throat> was feeding back like crazy, which meant I forgot this, the whole set. It was a complete disaster. I was convinced I was going to be sacked as mm -hmm. a result of that, but I wasn't. I was given a second chance. And you ask me something else. Uh, the six bob, bob tour. Mm. The six bob tour was, um, I think, for the price of fish and chips, with an extra saveloy perhaps thrown in, yeah. you could go and see three bands. Yes. And so, practically immediately, <clears throat> we were doing a sellout tour of of the UK, mm -hmm. and the influence of the other bands <clears throat> upon each other. Uh, Linda's Farm was really. Um, they were having hit singles they understood something that perhaps we we didn't uh, we weren't necessarily as accessible we were certainly more detailed they were more stripped back uh, but they were a good time band and um, I think both Genesis and Van, Van Groff weren't uh, we were perhaps both bands were storytellers and so you got musical odysseys with mm -hmm with both these bands, the journeying songs, etc. But um, the the thing about Genesis, uh, about Linus Farm was they had that immediacy. They they mm. had they had the touch at that time. And I watched many shows of theirs and I thought what a beautiful song Lady Eleanor was. I thought this is just absolutely lovely, great harmonies. Very, 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 very good. And I was speaking to Ray Jackson recently, funny enough, he came along to one of my shows, um, <clears throat> complimenting him on his 
extraordinary mandolin work on uh, Maggie May for Rod Stewart. That was absolutely beautiful. It's a, interesting. You know, he'd, play, he'd do a harmonica solo that went through a number of the things that I'd, I'd learned on the harmonica when I was of a certain age. And uh, mm -hmm. he'd go through Zed Carl's Scotland the Brave, all the things you <laughs> can do on unaccompanied uh, 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 harmonica. And um, it was part of it. And it became part of the clap along. And mm -hmm. it involved the audience. And um, so I think you must never under, underestimate the, the power of audience participation. Yeah. Not yeah. too much of that with Genesis, probably nil with um, Van de Graaff Generator, but... Certainly for Lindisfarne. Certainly for Lindisfarne, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, you describe Can Utility in the Coastliners as a, a song that was hard to play live and was uh, subsequently dropped. Yes. Uh, Mark, um, for the up and coming tour, um, yeah. have you gotten much better at playing that or have you adjusted it in some way? Yes. Uh, um, I think uh, the, the change from 12 string guitar to electric, um, I tend to use a chorus sound and then I need to work out that because we're not in group rehearsals yet. Mm -hmm. But I've been through that tune personally and we played it in recent years. Uh, there's a live album live in Liverpool and it was Roy Nostolp who was on a combination of um, in the main he was totally overqualified with us because he's a great guitarist himself of course with the Flower Kings he was playing bass with us filling in and um, and playing guitar um, playing very acts doing oh that's 12 string really yeah. so you've got that chiming thing between two guitars and a bit of keyboard. Um, it goes through a lot of changes. Um, I actually think it's a very good song. I think it's got some wonderful moments. Never mind. I mean, I wrote the song part and the lyrics, um, but I, I suspect for me, because I will always be a fan of what the other guys brought to it, um, mm -hmm. as it goes into instrumental sections, um, Mike Rutherford came up with a couple of chords that we powered away on. And then Tony came up with an extraordinary Mellotron solo that sounds just like a, a piece of classical string writing and yeah. um, it's harmonically sophisticated. Uh, at that moment, Phil is playing it like a jazz drummer. You've got a bass pedal intoning like a bell. <laughs> and um, and at that moment, you know, it does it does do something really quite magical that I think only only Genesis had at that time. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to doing it. It's not an easy one to do, but it's um, um has its challenges. But hey I'm looking um looking forward to seeing it. Uh <clears throat> um how much did Brian Eno actually contribute to the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway? Uh, are some of his parts actually listenable on on the record if you listen harder? Well uh Brian Eno came in and did some treatments for a day in other words he had some um, he had some devices and uh, we experimented with putting various th things through those devices including um, um, some vocal parts and some guitar parts in the main and may have been a little bit of keyboard in there but um, it may have been maybe maybe a couple of days um, but um, um, I wouldn't say it was as much parts because mm -hmm. essentially the album was was ready to mix by by that stage. Most yeah. of it had been done, uh, but the idea of doing strange things with vocals and guitars that that um, were put through um, some early synth stuff that he that he had. Um, uh, it, it, it was great because he came in. He was a breath of fresh air. He, yeah. he, um, uh, you know, at, at times things could get very tense with Genesis, with the yeah. you know the, the nucleus, and I think that um, another person come, coming in with fresh ideas was able to dispel atmospheres and just do it all with a smile. So that's it. It's mm -hmm. a temporary job. No one's going to complain either way. If you like it, you use it. If not, you don't. I, I regret the fact that I haven't worked with him sense because i do think he's a very bright guy and and very nice very sweet of course he went on to do the um the bowie uh berlin 
stuff shortly after yes. that. Yes, 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 that's right. You know, Bowie, another Crimson fan, and um, you know the whole thing, the EG management thing that that takes in Roxy Music as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's families, isn't it, of, of musicians that tend to, or branches of the tree splinters off, but somehow their their connections, tendrils, going on. Yeah. Um, selling in by the pound uh, with its exploration of Englishness and identity. Um, mm. Do you think it bears any similarity thematically to the kinks we have Village Green Preservation Society? Well, I think that at times um, the idea of, of Britishness as something mm. worth preserving has crept into song from time to time. I think Village Green Preservation Society has done... It, with a tongue-in-cheek thing but then there That's was the wordplay. Isn't it? yes there, there was the wordplay that um that um, pete brought to um dancing with the moon at night and i mm. and i do think it's actually my favorite genesis tune we don't play it every mm. tour but i've played it on several and um it's another tune that has its has its challenges yeah, just yeah. to be able to play the guitar solo with all the sort of attendant bits of production that I have to produce with my feet, uh, that, you know, tapping, sweet picking, octave jumps, all of that. Um, and that's only part of the tune. You've got the Elgarian yeah. thing as you well. you think the Kinks album was far more sardonic than the Genesis album? Um, perhaps. I mean, I've got a lot of time for the Kinks. Yeah. Um, I think they're very good and um, uh, at times progressive, at some other times much more stripped back as proto punk almost, you know. And um, mm. but I, I think that um, the writing was very, Excellent. very good at times. And, and, and again, it sounds sweeter with the passing of time, it's very touching, you know. Waterloo Sunset, of course, um, mm. is um, somehow, you know, something very, very touching about those lives and you realize who terry and julie are and oh. um and the idea that in a way you get to know them again as ingenues in yes. in the song of course they become big stars and that's it but somehow it personalizes mm. something that might all be seen as a, a great big banner hollywood you know mm. you forget that it was just terry and julie at one time yeah. Your first solo album, um, uh, many have said it, it, it sounds as, as almost as if it could be a Genesis album, if you forgive me for saying that. Yeah. But it's your album, Please Don't Touch, which interests me. It has a very transatlantic feel to it. Uh, was this record a conscious decision to distance yourself from that Genesis sound? I think that I was aware after Lamb Lies Down on Broadway that, you know, Peter Gabriel had tried as he said in his words, to sort of drag Genesis screaming into the 1980s compared to whatever the, the 70s represented. So I think, you know, um, I think he was heading into a more industrial, less romantic area. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, you know, he did it very, very well um, and definitively. But um, for me, I was after another kind of thing. I, I wanted this cross between... You know what would the what would the what would the black singers bring to it? What would the what would those musicians? What would Black America bring to a white guy in his mid twenties, um, desperately trying to write songs that might have some relevance to them, and allow them space to um, improvise and scat and do various things and not hold the reins too tightly, but mm -hmm. allow things to happen. And that's when I both felt most uncomfortable and left myself wide open and vulnerable, but that was what produced the best results. I mean, I had no idea why at the end of um, Icarus Ascending, the last track, why was it the band liked to jam on the last two chords and just keep going? And I thought, well, they like doing this, but I'll, you know, I'll bin that in the final instance mm -hmm. um, because it'll be irrelevant on record. But then, of course, when Richie Havens came in, the late, great Richie Havens, mm -hmm. um, he said, oh, I could sing over that. And then he opens up the lungs and and although he's improvising, you get the feeling of it's a free flight by then. And he's yeah. 
floating and he's grooving with it, um, using that old that old chestnut, the word grooving. And he, <laughs> he was, he was, he just um, gave it everything. And it's a, it's a wonderful vocal from him. It's not uh, an album that's... Uh... From uh, Randy Crawford, yeah. And uh, Steve Walsh, of course, who's fantastic. Steve Walsh. But it's not an album that's represented particularly well live. Uh, uh, am I mistaken there? Um, I've done Icarus in recent years with Nad because I swear at, at times he, he channels various singers, including <laughs> Richie Havens. There was one night when he was doing I swear if I'd turned around, there would have been Richie Havens right there. It had all the depth, all of the passion, all the resonance. And I thought, oh my God, you know, that's that's extraordinary. So I know it's one of his favorites. But so at some point I may decide to inc include it. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, it, it was an, a kind of an anomalous album. I was trying to do a, a sampler of all my best wares. I was trying to do uh, the equivalent of one of those Rock Machine Loves You type albums. I don't know if you're familiar with those that yeah. were out at one time in the late sixties really. Um, CBS albums where you'd have a, Gar a Simon Garfunkel track next to a Lennon Cohen track, Grateful Dead, mm -hmm. uh, Roy Harper, uh, Tim Rose, and you'd listen to it just like people listen to their own favourite playlists now. And you think, oh, it's gone from this to this to this, but yeah. they're all interesting. Yeah. Uh, the Zombies, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Time of the Season. And there were a couple of uh, those albums and I thought, I wonder if I could do that where people listen to it and and to have that level of diversity where they couldn't really tell who'd written it or who they were listening to. Mm. Here's a different lineup of musicians. These songs sound very different. So Tony Stratton Smith, who was the label boss, said to me, it's both its strength and its weakness. You know, mm. it's 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 variety, um, mm. it's diversity. Uh, but it's done now, so yeah, it's I, I like I like that album actually. I listen to it often. Um, Tiger Moth is quite a ghostly number. Um, to what extent does this reveal your own fascination with the afterlife, or is it because you're perhaps a big Mr. James fan? Uh, well, um, Mr. James and I think Stephen Wilson also Mr. James. Um, but um, I, I I was and am still fascinated with the possibility of, of an afterlife mm -hmm. um, and even a pre life. So uh, there's possibilities uh, with all of that. And by the time I was doing Spectral Mornings, of course, it was the whole basis for the album was really predicated upon the idea of some type of, of, of survival. Uh, and that gave the album a focus. And I don't know too many people who were sort of quite sort of knocking on heaven's door in quite that 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 way uh but you know the idea of transcendence um has appealed to me both before that and and after it and um i think ev everyone throughout their lives will find that they have these anomalous experiences where somehow for no no explicable reason you will have a premonition of of a future event, for instance, and then it turns on your head the whole notion of time. And then reading C.S. Lewis, who's a Christian apologist, um, and if you take Christianity out of the equation, and reading about his early experiences in the First World War, where he was blown up by a shell, but realised that he was having an out-of-body experience, although it wasn't described as an oob in the way modern people do, um, you have to take on board the idea uh, consciousness is it merely local or is it universal um, and many evidential things later of verifiable evidence um, I've found there have been fascinating stories that, that people I've known have had or indeed their parents or, or others there's, there's some fantastic stuff out there. I do realise it's an industry or they're potentially an industry you know, full of charlatans where it's you will meet a tall, you know, um, tall, dark, handsome stranger uh, across my palm with silver and a bit more dairy and I'll give you a bit more. Of course, you know, we know that, that, that there's a whole libraries of 
of this sort of stuff. But I think one mustn't throw out the baby with the bathwater mm -hmm. just because um, Houdini may have unmasked many fraudulent mediums. It doesn't mean to say that there may be a kernel of truth at the centre of it that draws everyone to it. We just don't know, do we? The great no. mystery is birth no. and death. That's it. Yeah. Uh, in 2005, Genesis met in Glasgow to discuss the possible reformation um, to play the lamb like some lamb shows. You said in yep. your biography that Peter was interested. Is this something that you may broach with him again? I mean, it doesn't have, to, I, I think we've given up hope of like a Genesis reunion, but maybe you and Peter Gabriel doing something like that? Is, is uh, it possible? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, 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 Pete and I are, are pals. Um, I probably talk to Pete more often than I do the rest of the Genesis guys mm -hmm. um, because we're both ex-Genesis these days, of course. And uh, I have huge respect for Pete's work, both as a, a musician and singer uh, but also as a humanitarian whose mm -hmm. whole orientation towards um, all things world music and giving other people a chance, um, you just know where he's coming from with all of that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's um, it was very disappointing that we had a, a, a get-together with, with all, all, all of us in... Um, or the five-man team in 2005, but we couldn't find sufficient common ground to be able to continue on. Um, I think I was, you know, probably the most flexible of everybody and said, well, if you need me, call me. And um, it's been a very long wait. So um, uh, I don't imagine that that five-man team is likely to come together. Um, but, you know, maybe it will, for all the right reasons, one day, whatever that is so the last time we basically did it as a team was um in 1982 um to help out should have been filmed that. I think. I, it should have been filmed um absolutely um uh, subsequently i did something for tabworth court and both uh, pete and and mike were in, in involved in that and we managed to keep that hospital open so again there was you know, a partial reunion for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, who knows, you know, if there's whatever it takes to move. The move mountains. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, John Fogarty, I've just read his autobiography. He said that uh, Scotty Moore invented rock and roll guitar. To what extent do you agree with him? Um, one of the early progenitors of mm -hmm. rock and roll i'm not sure it's any one person who invented rock and roll i think lennon is quoted by saying chuck berry invented rock and roll um who or is it les paul coming up with the electric guitar or is there some other chap before that or mm -hmm. was it this you know was it bill or was it ben i mean um yeah, I think we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. I did meet Les Paul at one point and um, had a chance to compliment him on his his vision of things. And recently, if you're talking about early early efforts, you know, listening to the Everly Brothers, um, Joe and I, we, we're listening to the Everlys all the time, thinking, "Wow, you know, what great songs, what great harmonies, yeah, uh, what." Roots that you can trace to, to the Beatles directly, and the very last hit that they had was something written by Paul McCartney after they'd um, not had a hit record for twelve years and hadn't played together or sang together for, for ten years. Um, there's a lovely track called "On the Wings of a Nightingale," and it's absolutely beautiful. And um, we were listening to it only yesterday, Joe and I. Yeah, it's just great. I always think it's a terrible shame that uh, that initial band with Elvis Presley was broken up and he kind of went his solo way. I just think uh, those Sun recordings are fantastic. Uh, oh, fantastic stuff. Chet Atkins involved with, oh, with his early, 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 early uh, records of, um, of of the Everlys as well. And that's something I wasn't really aware of. You know, who's that uh, guitarist? Uh, how yeah. are we doing for time? Are we, uh, we going to yeah, wrap fine. it up? Okay. No, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. So uh, we're okay. Yeah. Um, uh, in what way did uh, John Lennon express an interest in Genesis? Well, this is very interesting. Um, 
apparently um he gave an interview to radio that, I, that I'm yet to hear, but I think it's Nigel Pierce uh, in Norfolk, who's the DJ there, who said to me that he's got a tape of Lennon talking to, I'm not sure he, he was talking to, but saying that he thought there were two, two bands who were true sons of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And he said one was ELO um, and one was Genesis and um, it's quite subtle I think the influence of the Beatles on Genesis but I gather that he said also that he he um, got all the Genesis records from uh, Nursery Crime onwards sent over to him in New York so whether it was a connection to all things British um, because don't forget, there's the storytelling aspect and the Jabberwocky aspect and yeah. the wordplay that I think that both Peter Gabriel and, and, and John Lennon shared. Um, there is that, but there's, there is a British style, and I think that it owes something to the Americans, but then I think that it also owes something to <clears throat> roots that are much earlier than that yeah. on our side of the Atlantic. <clears throat> but um uh we, we were talking about great guitarists um and influences um i'm just intrigued uh, uh how uh, how you as a guitarist would rate uh, frank zappa and and was he an influence at all i think when i think of, of zappa these days when he's mentioned it's in the sort of seminal sense of, of the great teacher that he's doing this and 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 what have you. But, you know, I have a few anecdotes from friends who are talking about the fact that he would suddenly change the key of the tune on the night and expect his musicians to be able to play it, yeah. um, which would have created um, havoc. Yeah. And um, I think that um, he obviously wanted his musicians to be working to a very high standard. Um, but I tend to think of him as, a, as you know, an impresario, a, an all-round entertainer in the best sense of the word. You had humour, you had music, you had this, you had the show, you had... It was an extraordinary thing that he was doing live on MTV, this long-form piece. Never mind Genesis and Supper's Ready, this was a long-form piece, and it seemed to take him just about everything, and there's streamers going off, and it's this party atmosphere, but it's right on the money, and it's really... Really great. I, I know that Chester used to say, he said, yeah, Frank kills himself trying to play his own guitar parts. And uh, other times he would say, yeah, Frank was, you know, he would carry around a, cof- a, a coffee urn and he'd be drinking coffee literally all day <laughs> and cigarettes. Not the greatest diet in the world, but that's what he needed to fuel him up yeah. and do that. And I gather all those musicians who joined that band uh, they say, well, what album would you like me to concentrate on? And he'd say, all of it. So he would put his musician through hell. So if ever I think I'm a slave driver, <laughs> expecting my lot to come up with. Oh, you know, Miles Davis. Three, three or four albums. As as well. Yeah. Well, probably, yeah. And, and yeah. so um, that's it, perhaps, you know. Well, with um, Zappa, there's those series of albums he did, uh, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, which I just think absolutely fabulous. Yes. Uh, right. It's um, a very I'm... interesting concept. Yeah. That isn't it. Shut up and play your guitar. Uh, well, um, it's one way of of, uh, of moving forward and just going, you know, this has got, uh, 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 it's got integrity, got cr- credibility. This is it. Not afraid to show your, your roots and go yeah. for it. Yeah. 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 I have uh, one question left for you, really. It's, sure. uh, I'm just intrigued. Why did Chrysalis pass on the Defector album? Um, well, I'll tell you. Spectral Mornings, they considered to be esoteric in the extreme. Mm-hmm. And um, because of that, um, they had recently signed um, Blondie and they were headed into a more pop direction. Mm-hmm. Up to then, they'd had Jethro Tull and it was firmly an album's direction. Um, so um, 
I don't think that Terry Ellis, who was heading up the the uh, the, the team in in America, quite got it with every day. I was very pr proud of every day, and when I do it live, it tends to go down very well. Yeah. But I don't think he really understood the song. You know why? Why is it like this? I think that he was very firmly thinking top 40, top 40, top 40. Mm -hmm. um, and the American scene was shortly to become very, very tight. You know, the power of of FM radio and college radio, the day of that that broke so many bands was um, was shortly to be taken over by the, you know, well, the radio demographic says, yeah. you know, just play top 40. So um, uh, America lost a lot of its variety at that time, and Defector was one one of those. Don't forget, at the same time, Peter Gabriel was signed to Atlantic, and um, you know, having done that extraordinary album, Peter Gabriel Number Three, yeah, suddenly he was being signed to Geffen because um, Ahmet Erdogan thought that Pete was mentally ill. <laughs> um, uh, they, they they don't always get it, but then they didn't get it with Hendrix either. So you know. Um, um, mm. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that every American is like this. This is not not the case. Plainly, not the case. Um, mm. But I I think that the idea of um, focusing something which um, is is an easy sell is more the pressure of America. Whereas perhaps the the eccentrics that may blunder into great commercial success. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I would include Genesis in this. Um, yeah, you see what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, out of interest, um, it's a silly, uh, silly question, really. But uh, do you really think the Fountain of Salamassus is way too sexy for Italian radio? Indeed, um, mm. that was extraordinary, wasn't it? You know, that apparently it had been banned because a woman somewhere who was a controller, the equivalent of Auntie the BBC. Mm -hmm. decided that um, it was too sexy, perhaps because of the hermaphrodites or perhaps it was because of the sh crescendos, which I know somebody compared those sort of crescendos to, you know, a series of orgasms. And um, so um, if music is allowed to exist at its fullness, then um, we can have orgasms and eargasms to our heart's content. Absolutely. Absolutely. Steve, um, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. I, your thank Fox you. Not tour starts soon. Yes. Uh, best of luck with that. I'll um, thank I'll you. The link for the dates and I'll put that under this video as well. Brilliant. Thank um, you. I hope to see the show in Cambridge. Right. And, uh, thank have, you. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm sure you've thank got you lots so of other interviews to be doing. Uh, that's great. I've, I've done a few. I think this might be the last one today. I might have one. I don't know if I've got one tonight. No, I think I'm, I think I'm off the hook. So I'm back to rehearsals, really. <laughs> yeah, good. I'll let you get on with that. And thank you so Brilliant. much for doing this. Cheers, Barry. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Again, all the best. Cheers. Bye. Bye.